our third paper presenter, please, um, Kevin. Um, this will be on rethinking regional security. Interesting because that's exactly the point that you ended up with now. So it has opened up um, nicely into the next topic, Re um, rethinking regional security in Central Africa, the case of the Central African Republic. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. I think I wouldn't really use uh, that much time. I'm usually very brief. It's uh, a topic that really uh, takes my breath because I believe strongly that if nothing is done as far as this is concerned, uh, then uh, other issues, especially those of development in Africa, would be impossible uh, for quite a very long time. Why do we need to rethink uh, regional security in Central Africa? I was interested in doing a presentation on this because so far, I think most would agree uh, that what has been put in place as far as regional efforts are concerned has been a total failure. But when we look at the literature, when we look at the realities on the ground, it is clear that there is a need for local players, for regional players, to actively get involved in addressing security situations in their vicinity. So why is it that these fail? That is what I hope we are going to look at. And I believe that uh, when we address that properly, it is going to enable us to understand exactly uh, why we need to actually uh, rethink even the, 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 the perception or the conception of security that has been predominant in uh, the, uh, the, the, the decisions and the management of the security operations in Central Africa as in many other parts of, of Africa. So we have, uh, as for a fact, that uh, we, in Africa initially we did not have uh, interest in regional security. After independence, African states had cold feet in, in involving themselves in issues that concern security because it was felt uh, that uh, this precious thing that they had just acquired would very easily be lost if they got involved in such a sensitive thing as security. So uh, most states uh, wanted to interact with each other, but uh, they wanted to interact in ways that they would completely preserve their autonomy over the management of their internal affairs, especially uh, security. The focus then was on the economy, was on economic uh, relations, but even uh, with these economic relations, we, we, we see that over the turn of the century, a little or nothing was achieved. If something was achieved on the economic front, perhaps these countries would not have faced uh, the, the, the difficulties that they have faced in terms of conflict uh, because of uh, what we are going to look at as far as uh, security in itself uh, is concerned. So how do we look at security? We can look at security as something uh, that people want because it makes them feel better because it makes them able to actually take care of the things that they, they believe are important in their lives. And so uh, once we look at security in that way, we would therefore rule out completely all of those conceptions of security that consider it uh, to be something that has to be decided and given to somebody uh, for their interest. The participation of the beneficiaries, the primary beneficiaries in security uh, decision making is therefore very important. But this appears not to have been the case in uh, the Central African region. 
So we, we, we have uh, a, a change from uh, a very, a very difficult uh, situation of intervention uh, where uh, from the 1990s, with the end of the Cold War, countries start actually seeing in the Central African region, as in many other parts of the world, uh, that without addressing these security problems that were propping up, it, they may actually affect the very sovereignty uh, that they actually uh, protected very fervently. They start putting up uh, security mechanisms. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the, the, the efforts were made uh, mostly through the United Nations, uh, but with, in the Central African Republic, they put in place of the Bonuka, uh, for instance, but uh, these, for, these efforts failed. Failed uh, perhaps because the United Nations was a very distant actor uh, that the Central African states, uh, particularly the CEMAC states, the six members of CEMAC, were uh, interested in but trying to act uh, through uh, an, an agent uh, that was very far from the realities on the ground. So this situation actually pushes uh, the Central African states to think about engaging on security themselves. And that's why in 1999 uh, in Malabo, uh, a decision was actually taken now by the wider and what I have called the more representative uh, uh, institution in the sub-region, that is ACAS, uh, to uh, put in place a security mechanism. Now, at the time that the, the states are taking this decision, uh, the, those that felt more threatened by the challenges of security in the Central African Republic that had experienced recurrent coups from independence had actually taken a quicker step by establishing a joint uh, force uh, to address the peace uh, situation or the conflict situation in this state. Uh, that would later on be taken over by, uh, by, by ACAS. But what we actually see is uh, in the efforts to actually address the security problems in the Central African Republic, uh, the, the, the institutions as well as the mechanisms that have been put in place have not addressed uh, the, the, the sources of the conflict in the Central African Republic properly. Why have they not addressed? Because we, we consider uh, in this case that the sources have been uh, those that uh, pertain particularly to the inability of the state to actually address the concerns or the needs of the Central African Republic. And so this, the insecurity situation of the Central African Republic is, has not been a military one. It has been mostly uh, it has been mostly one of inaccessibility of uh, most parts of the country. It has been one of the, the precarious uh, kind of living that most Central Africans have found in, themselves in. And that's why you would see that most armed, armed groups in the Central African uh, Republic, like the APRD, uh, that have taken up arms in the past have claimed uh, that they were doing the job that the state failed to do. They, they, they claim that the populations needed them more than the state. And so uh, that absence of the state in the different uh, parts of the Central African Republic and the result which has been a life of poverty, uh, misery, has actually created a space for uh, uh, political entrepreneurs and insurgent groups to actually use uh, and bring about insecurity. Unfortunately, when uh, the Central African states sought to address this problem of insecurity, uh, what has been done, uh, what was done was actually to put in place forces to protect a regime because apparently uh, the interest was to make sure that uh, other armed groups that are interested in such unconstitutional work such changes in, I shouldn't say unconstitutional, but that are interested in changes uh, in power uh, through uh, coups, 
would, would, would actually be deterred. And this has resulted in most of these security operations being concentrated around Bangui. And for the state of Cameroon, for instance, whenever it has contributed troops, these troops have actually been located in areas where it feels it's going to protect, they would protect its own interests and actually not uh, the interests of the Central African state. So this sort of statist approach to security in the Central African Republic has clearly failed. It has clearly failed because uh, in 2007, uh, the United Nations was again uh, forced to send another mission uh, to the Central African Republic. Uh, in in uh, 2013, uh, that is very recently, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with, the, with this growth in the security crisis, uh, we have actually seen that the regional effort has completely been supplanted by international peacekeeping forces, uh, by a regional, a, a regional talking here, or, or, or should I say a continental, because I've been using regional up to this point to actually mean uh, uh, the efforts by states within uh, a particular part of Africa. Uh, by, uh, they have now been supplanted by continental efforts and international efforts, um, referring here to the United Nations, uh, because of that failure to actually address uh, the, what were really the security concerns of the Central African uh, people. So in a nutshell, uh, the regional efforts in Central African Republic, like uh, in any other situation, in Africa would probably need to take into account the sources of conflict because clearly uh, these efforts are needed because when we look at the particular case of the Central African Republic, the impact has been definitely more on the neighbors in terms of receiving uh, very strong uh, refugee flows uh, from this country in terms of having illegal wep wep weapons cross the borders, uh, which uh, threaten even uh, the security of the populations in particularly border regions like the eastern region in Cameroon and, and others. So these efforts definitely are necessary, but they would have to involve, they would have to take into account the need to involve Central Africans uh, at all levels in the decision making in security, meaning that we need to move from a situation where it's about boots on the ground to a situation where it's about how do we ad address the unemployment problem in Bosangoa, how do we address the, uh, the food crisis in Beberati and so on. And until that perception, regional uh, peace uh, building, uh, takes this sort of conception, we would not be actually acting as people that are close, uh, closer to this state uh, than other international actors. Because if the UN has to be effective in the Central African Republic, it has to be acting based on information still from the, the states that are closest to this one. And the issues are not gone in the Central African Republic. The issues are that Central Africans have not been engaging with each other in the past, uh, talking now precisely about, for instance, uh, the, what we are looking at as a religious rift uh, between uh, the Muslims and the Christians. Uh, you simply need to get these populations to engage uh, with each other. Uh, the issue of uh, Muslims are taking away the, the jobs or whatever by the Christians should not happen if you think a strategy, a security strategy, that would oblige these different segments of the Central African Republic to work together. Thank you. Papa can I ask you 15 minutes? Thank you.
Thank you. Well, uh, my uh, my task here is to uh, to try uh, to integrate these uh, these excellent uh, presentations that you heard with uh, one you have not heard, uh, based on uh, the paper uh, by uh, my colleague and good friend Medani, who for some reason could not make it. Now, th that is not uh, an, an easy task, uh, but uh, clearly it is uh, made easier by uh, the, uh, the excellent uh, conceptual framework that uh, uh, Fumi and Goodwin uh, set for us. Uh, and that framework, I think, is, uh, is nothing to, to, uh, to really argue about. I think it is quite sound, and it is the basis for a, 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 a good analysis of the security predicament of uh, the continent and uh, certainly of uh, the Horn of Africa and definitely uh, the CAR. I just happened to have been in the CAR on a mission uh, just three weeks ago. So I, I uh, can start uh, by uh, uh, saying uh, amen to anything that uh, Kevin said. Uh, and also to, to, to say that, well, what he said is, I think, a pretty good illustration of the gap uh, that uh, uh, Fumi and, and Goodwin uh, called our attention to. Uh, so clearly, uh, the, 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 the one critical element that was left out of ways to understand much less to try to bring solutions to the security predicament of our continent and particular regions and particular specific countries has been to leave out completely society and its dynamics and uh, its evolution and uh, its own take on security. Now, uh, when they have discussed about the, uh, the security problem uh, on the continent, Fumi and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Goodwin call our attention to the need to keep in mind the historical dimension of this, where all this came from. And they started with the colonial state. Actually, I would even go a little further back in history. Now, remember that colonization was rationalized in terms of providing security for uh, the African societies that were effectively, certainly, but supposedly from the perspective of Europeans ravaged by uh, uh, inter-tribal uh, wars and also uh, the uh, slave raiding operations that were going on in certain parts of the continent. So we came to bring you security, uh, to prevent the continuation of slaving, but also to make sure that uh, your own uh, 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 warrior kind of culture is keep, uh, kept in check. So that was the, the overarching framework uh, for colonialism. And of course, the colonial state that resulted from that came also from that logic, to keep in check uh, the societies in which uh, 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 benevolent European powers were coming in. So that framed the colonial state. Now, nobody asked the population then what were their security uh, concerns. Did they invite anybody, etc. So that continued. So it was only normal that that colonial state that was superimposed in societies did not involve them in any engagement or any conversation, to use uh, Fumi's uh, concept. And of course, whenever you uh, uh, superimpose another view or another uh, conceptualization of reality on people, you would need intermediaries. And those, of course, were found in the elites that uh, uh, Fumi mentioned. Now, the only part that I would encourage uh, maybe Fumi and, and Goodwin to think more 
carefully about and maybe to dig a little bit deeper in terms of theorizing is that dichotomy they create between the state and the elite. Is it possible that maybe this, the kind of state that we had had to secrete that kind of elites? Uh, that uh, particularly in the area of security, what I call the securocrats. So is there a, a connection to be, to be a little bit uh, uh, dug a little bit more about conceptually to see the, that to, uh, to maybe uh, learn more about the, the, uh, the nature of the elite that had to come from that state. Uh, now, let me see if I can bring in the, uh, uh, the uh, paper by, uh, by uh, Medani. He too, I think, proceeded from the same logic that, well, the security in the Horn of Africa cannot be understood in terms of that state-centric uh, framework that uh, uh, seems to, to have been uh, espoused by everybody when trying to understand uh, why there is so much insecurity. He said, well, what we need to do is to look at the, what he called the conflict chain. You have to look, he says, about the foundations of the state in uh, uh, the Horn of Africa to understand why is it that uh, we have this security uh, problem. Next, you have to look at the ecological and environmental problems to which also Fumi alluded, that uh, sometimes are at the root of most of the security problems that our states uh, and our societies uh, 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 are confronted with. The next category in that conflict chain, he says, is the radicalization and, interna and international security challenges. Because of some of the challenges societies have been facing, and particularly the, the fact that the state is not at all adapted to the societies, did not, ma did not match well with uh, uh, the security of the, uh, the members of the societies uh, in the states. And again, Fumi uh, also talked about uh, the fact that, well, uh, the security as conceptualized at the individual level, uh, uh, based on gender, based on generation, are not taken into consideration. And the state that uh, was inherited from the colonial experience the, was not equipped to, uh, to uh, face that, that reality, to, to acknowledge that reality and to operate on the basis of that reality as far as security is concerned. And of course, uh, that uh, radicalization uh, of uh, society, because the state did not, uh, could not uh, meet its needs, translated in uh, uh, the, uh, the arrival of all kinds of ideologies, uh, religious-based or, or not, uh, before it. And finally, he said, well, in that conflict chain also one has to, to understand uh, the legacies of militarization of uh, uh, the uh, of war uh, in in that uh, I mean uh, the legacies of war and militarization in the Horn of Africa uh, because of uh, again uh, the um, border disputes between a number of states because of the internal dynamics that resulted in uh, 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 conflicts getting out of the uh, uh, state borders you have a, a, a region that is traversed by all kinds of uh, uh, security challenges. And uh, the, the arrival of international forces in the mix uh, and their conception of security. Uh, for example, he says, well, uh, uh, this notion that uh, all you need to do is to arrive at a, uh, a peace agreement uh, based on someone else uh, sitting somewhere else's conception of what is needed in a particular conflict uh, does not uh, do the trick. And uh, of course, uh, you have peace uh, the agreement after peace agreement that do not go to the root causes of these conflicts. And uh, anything that is driven by an agenda coming from elsewhere or an agenda based on uh, just the state in complete uh, uh, ignorance of uh, the uh, 
the dynamics uh, of these societies themselves uh, will not result in, in peace. And he gives the example of uh, uh, Sudan and uh, uh, Somalia, northern and southern part of it, to illustrate that uh, a conception of security that, is, that completely ignores the internal dynamics of society and ignores the connection between all these elements in the chain of conflict will not uh, end up resolving the security predicament that uh, 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 is still uh, uh, characterizing uh, the, uh, the Horn of Africa. Now, let me just conclude. Again, the conceptualization of state, society, and the elite is, I think, uh, a, a sound one to uh, analyze the security predicament in, uh, in Africa. Certainly, in, it, it, it illustrated very well in the paper by, uh, by Madani. And again, uh, South African Republic is a pretty good example of this disconnect between uh, the national leadership in that country uh, uh, and the population. And of course, finally, the, uh, the role of external powers, uh, including uh, ones that are benevolent and uh, trying to do the right thing. That disconnect uh, uh, has to be acknowledged uh, and has to be uh, uh, maybe uh, alleviated by focusing a little bit more on uh, what are the real concerns, the real dynamics in our societies, uh, so that we can design uh, uh, solutions to the security predicament that are not solutions concocted elsewhere, that are not solutions based on a coterie of elites uh, uh, that gravitate around the state and uh, completely ignore what are the drivers of, of conflict and therefore what are the solutions to that conflict. All right, I'm going to stop here. Hopefully I was able to, uh, to uh, connect these, uh, these uh, three papers, but uh, certainly uh, whatever gap I left, you will fill. Right, colleagues, we have a little bit of a uh, time constraint conversable space. Um, but let's make good use of it. If you want to comment or ask a question or make a contribution, you can do so by show of hands. Please introduce yourself just so that everyone is aware of who's speaking. And please, let's try and keep it fairly brief so that we can have as many inputs as possible. We've already had the presentations, no further presentations. Um, Let's see how well we can work with our time. Right, can I see by show of hands? Is one, two, three, four, okay. Two on this side, two on this side. Let's take all four and then ask the presenters to respond and then we can see whether we've got time for another round. Uh, my name is Frederico Kim. Um, there is... Um, the concept that keeps uh, arising from uh, most of the presentations uh, about the this the so-called elite and their and their um, you know um, the gap uh, in their interventions or in who, who are these elites? Um, I may I may want to ask this because. This is something that, um, when we look at conflict and um, um, uh, security situation in Africa, there is the mention of the elites and their contribution to, or, you know. And I want to understand how the, this elitism actually arises in our society. Thank you. There was a second and here right at the back. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Ndiate. I'm a fellow AIC. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> My first question uh, goes to Dr. Fumi. Uh, 
and she actually made a very good presentation of uh, leadership and this and uh, actually gave some way forward to see how we could solve the predicament. But what I'm asking here is that uh, more often we discuss about doing this and we understand that this, the people at a level of position that are to initiate the move, but we realize that these people are aloof to propose that. Because when yesterday we were discussing about the security sector reform of the African Union, it's there, it's present, but nothing is done to that. Is there any other way, this is the question, is there any other way to get it done? That's the first question. And the second question goes to um, Dr. Kiven. You were talking about uh, the situation in Central African Republic. Effort of uh, regional integration, ECAS, CIMAC. Imagine Chad, which is like no longer in the movement of negotiation, the armament of Chad or the military intervention of Chad in all the conflict, in some of the conflict in Africa. Chad is like uh, uh, sided aside, put aside in this negotiation because of its initial involvement behind the Seleka. How do you rethink or how do you come with this regional integration if Chad is not part of the game? Maybe officially Chad might be part of the game, but practically Chad seems not to be part of the game. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to answer, I think, to a few. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Mike Sebalu, a member of the East African Legislative Assembly. I'm a member of a regional parliament. I just want to thank the presenters for a job well done. I, I just want to put um, some aspects into consideration as we look at this critical subject. Uh, we have to look at security as a common good and also factor in the aspect of the centrality of the people as major stakeholders in security architecture. Because the people, security is about people. When we talk about integration where we are, uh, like in the East African community, we are not integrating states. We are actually integrating people. But you find that the people are not given their space as major stakeholders. How do we get this to be appreciated even more? Secondly, we also have seen certain levels of insecurity resulting from the struggle for power acquisition and power retention. So the notion of power is something that we need to give further consideration and thought. And finally, we also need to look at the kind of state security apparatus uh, that was inherited by African states at independence in terms of quality and quantity. Uh, because there were serious aspects which we tended to gloss over. In many African states, it did not reflect the national character. You'd find that certain parts of the country were encouraged and promoted to take the bulk in security apparatus and in the security organs. And in some places, it was even qualification was made in such a way that certain regions or tribes could not simply qualify. In certain areas, they put height five feet and above five foot and above in terms of height. Now you find that certain people who are six foot and below, whether good or educated, they would simply not join. But also in terms of education, I want to give the, the case of Uganda. In terms of education, you find that it was those uneducated, literally riffraffs of society that, that, that dominated. And this alienated the people and the national character was not reflected. So you find certain communities, certain tribes, they are like, that is not for us. And that created serious uh, contradictions 
that we still need to look at in terms of society embracing and being part of the overall security architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Ekaipa, and I work here with the Africa Leadership Center. Um, I have three questions. So the, so the first set of presenters, well, to all the presenters, thank you very much for you know really, really a great paper. But maybe I'll start with the last presenter and to echo the question that came from Albert. Um, this notion that uh, regionalism um, and state centricness are you know at opposite poles, I, I think is problematic and. I think the reality is that regionalism must negotiate state centricness because all our state centricity, if you like, because um, all instances of successful regionalization actually rely very strongly on some strong states um, being very active in the mix. Uh, you think of ECOWAS, you think of Nigeria, you think of um, SADC, you think of South Africa, you think even of the African Union, and we're reminded of Libya's Gaddafi and you know the Renaissance team uh, in the later dispensation. So that's a and uh, and Wad uh, and Becky and Co. I think even if we take a global, think of the European Union and the role that Germany and France continue to play um, to prioritize um, the EU's agenda. So I think I don't think there's any way around it. I don't think you can talk about regionalism without talking about the, the role of states to drive a regional agenda. Um, uh, so I'd like to hear on the uh, the point that was made about Chad. I think that was very interesting. Um, for the first uh, presenters, I want to ask if there's such a dichotomy between, this, between state and society, and if society is being treated as a homogeneous category. Um, and I think the point about uh, the place of elites in this, how it, you know, elites on the one hand within society, and elites on the other hand interacting with the state. I think this is a very important point. And you know, even the idea that the aspirations of these two groups are so distinct, are they always so distinct? Because um, we, uh, Dr. Owens spoke, uh, spoke about um, Dr. Viley, the elections in Ikiti State. And the other side of that discussion has been the fact that the person that's now been elected into that position has spoken very much to the realities of members of, uh, of you know, Ikiti, you know, uh, people from Ikiti, and that's why he has been uh, uh, elected. And many people don't think he has a very positive agenda in mind, yet he has won the election fair and square. So I wanted to put that um, on board and also to ask whether they're also so started. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. I'm now first going to ask our presenters to respond and then we'll go into a next round. Um, some of the um, some of what we heard were comments and I think aimed at strengthening the papers, but there were also some very direct questions. So if you could very briefly attend to those, uh, Godwin, for me, um, given there, yeah, there at the back. And Bubakar, if you think it's necessary to come in as well. I think this, these are very powerful questions, and I already imagine that Eka would uh, will push me a little bit uh, on this issue. Let, let me start. You know, is there that dichotomy between state and society, and you link this also with equity process? Uh, you, you see, if, if we take this security conversation as part of a collective, uh, as a, a series of collective conversations, common conversations, um, and we mix this concept of leadership into it. I, I think there's a sense in which you begin to see some separateness in the storylines that emerge. Okay? If we're living in the same area, in the same spaces, uh, and our conversable spaces are not even the same, okay? It does not mean that people are not crisscrossing conversable spaces. They are. This is why we have all of this uh, group of actors that are, you know, that are ha taking part in many different conversations. But, but I, I think there's a sense in which when conversations are not collective, when the, the situations that we face, you cannot see commonalities at any point in time in those situations. No, it's not static. 
but actually you can see loads of separate spaces and separate actors acting on behalf of several things at, at different times. And actually that's, that dynamism is the very nature of leadership, okay? If we're saying that leadership is not about, ought not to be, because we're in a particular era in time, it ought not to be about ruling elite uh, and separation of agendas in that sense, and it ought to be about uh, our common experiences, our mutuality in a sense. Then, if we're saying it, you know, it ought not to be about individuals uh, and the position they hold, it should start with the situation that we face, then it should be about the process of resolving that challenge that we face together. But part of what I was trying to explain is that the challenges don't stay the same. Constantly changing. In fact, the moment you interact and deal with that problem, it produces another outcome and another chain of events. So if I am actually could be speaking a common conversation with those people four years ago, because it was about the moment in which, you know, uh, he appeared on the scene. And he emerged as someone who asserted influence and they ac accepted at that point in time. I don't want to belittle that, but we can imagine that four years later, the very, the, the very situation, no matter how narrow it is from those people's perspective, that's their perspective. If they don't see a commonality between them and him, and they see a commonality between uh, them and someone else, so be it. It does not mean that that itself will not produce its own dynamism. It changes. It is not static. I, I see the point that you're making, that is there a dichotomy at this point in time? You cannot see one smooth thread, especially in the area of security, which connects all of the people in those spaces. You can see different conversable spaces, and they lead to security needs because of the situation of their emergence. More often than not, it's necessarily different from that of other people in society. Sometimes it connects with some people in society. Okay? And that's actually why they, these are smart thinkers as well. If we were not allowing uh, our conversations to just evolve in common, then it means we have to engineer it. And in engineering it, you have to go to where your interests are. You understand? So there's a, a process of engineering that is going on which produces its own elite structures. But at no point in time, if you trigger many of the places that we're studying, do you see actually uh, a lot of mutuality in, in those needs? What connects me and my future is not easily seen when I see the security agenda that's been outlined for me. Part of why we then move into this regional conversation, Zeka, and I think that is where some of the disciplinary tightness comes into it. Uh, because if we're to separate security and how it's thought of from a development agenda, we might be thinking of different frameworks. Uh, and I think that is probably more of a tactical, operational tactical issue and not a strategic question. If you look at it as a strategic question, and we can see people in Central Africa, uh, despite you know some of the basic differences, and I think that's a point that Kevin, you, you probably want to speak to. It's a very fascinating one. If many things are on the table at the same time for us, it's food, uh, it's jobs, it's uh, the environment. It maybe not as stark um, uh, in that particular place. If we're having a common conversation as how, you know, about how we will reach a place of providing for the collective needs of people, there need not be a separation. And we can agree that it is states that act in particular ways to provide that. But what, has, what is happening in Central Africa, which is not dissimilar from the rest of the continent, but which Central Africa is, you know, the situation is particularly dire at the moment, is that we're not even having that conversation in order for us to say these are the structures through which we deliver those things. There's a regional conversation that goes on amongst people, and it goes on in an unstructured way. You only need to cross the borders and you know it in development terms. They will trade, they will talk, they will pursue common interests, and that's a form of regional arrangement. 
and it is most of the time not governed by states. But there's no reason why you should not have states mediating that space if we were all acting together for the same agenda. So it's not that they're supposed to be stuck in that way. At this moment, at this moment, you cannot see that common storyline in the area of security that cuts, you know, that connects everybody. That's the point that I'm making, but I understand that ECOWAS would do that, but that is also why ECOWAS itself, at this point in time, is not in charge. It's not in charge. There are different conversable spaces that are emerging in our region, and the state actors and the regional actors cannot deal with them. And so until we can connect the story and we're facing a mutual situation, I want to suggest that uh, we need to begin to analyze what drives Shabab, what drives Boko Haram, what drives the militia that are around us, from the point of view that they are responding, they're exchanging influence from, you know, with other parts of society. So if we're thinking that some state, some state pillars and some regional structures that we constructed that are not going to respond to the needs of ordinary people, are going to maintain security that people do not feel the same way with, we're joking, those people will exchange their own influence too at their own level of society, and we're going to see a lot of chaos which is your point yesterday, that actually that might be the pathway, that we need to see plenty of uh, leadership uh, exchanges. It's not neat, it's not peaceful, it's not stable, but maybe we first need to see it replicating until we say, ah, what is this? For the first time, the elite, even the global uh, greedy community of global actors will say, this is too much, we can't even eat in this place anymore. And then all of our story will converge. Maybe it needs to happen. Maybe we shouldn't be afraid of it. It's murky. So it makes the point you were making yesterday that, you know, perhaps our conversations have to look like this. And all I'm asking in order to answer Albert's point, uh, Albert's question, and your question, Albert, is uh, if that leadership, the elite, I know it's a big question to always talk about elite and so on. There are actors on the scene. It does not mean that they're exercising leadership. They're just one of the many actors in our space. I don't think there's only one way to engage them. And maybe our intellectual challenge is to multiply our conversable spaces. Because if, if the voices of those who are affected by security are not on the table in multiple ways, including through the violence that we're describing just now, but also in multiple ways in the time, I mean, music is a powerful, uh, you know, the, the, the realm of music is, is a powerful uh, conversation that goes on. And in every country, I think Sierra Leone had it, a particular moment where you saw the way musicians were contributing to the political story. We don't document it, we don't research it, we don't analyze it, we don't even call it security. Sometimes it's art. And that's what I found fascinating about the long 18th century in Europe and the conversations and the fact that it was possible for art, you know, to be speaking, artists to be speaking to each other and entering that space of conversation. We don't document it as security because the textbooks have not, con you know, have not called them security for us. If it's not a policeman carrying a weapon, it's not, a, you know, it's, it's not that kind of security. And so what I think I'm challenging us to do is to Think differently about the conversable spaces in which security, you know, in which security conversations are taking place. And they look different. And so I know that, you know, in, under the development agenda, you need a particular framework to deliver things. And they're not disconnected. But actually, I'm saying that we need to connect all the story and therefore have a framework that we agree on. And it could be that at the end of the day, our security forces or security institutions will look radically different when we've had that conversation from anything that has ever been constructed for us. Because nothing actually says that those people, those you know, things that are not registered may not be the deliverers of a particular form of security in the end. But who are they, you know, who are they accountable to? Who regulates them? And whose purpose, you know, who do they serve? But we need to have a conversation. Sorry. Uh, just very quickly to, to uh, again, echo the question you asked. Uh, uh, state centrism and regionalism, and what is the state has a role to play uh, in, region, in the regional agenda. I agree with you. But I think the, the, the more important question would be what agenda? 
because I think that's what distinguishes between the fact that the state plays a good role in regional integration, for instance. What we need to look at is what agenda, and if you are looking at security, for instance, who is conducting the discussion? Where are they conducting those discussions? And eventually, when you begin to think about it, really does a societal agenda come into the discussions that are being had? So we have, uh, say, at the military level, you will have commanders of the different countries sitting together to talk about a regional security agenda. But each one of that agenda is actually defined by a national interest. So you, you have a pretense of a regional security discussion taking place, but built into that is the sovereignty card that uh, the Honorable Sebalu was talking so I think the focus should be less for me about whether the state has a role to play or not. The focus must be what is it that we are placing on the table in discussing this regional agenda for which the state granted can lead. And I think when you ask that question, the answer that you begin to get, for, in my view, is that it's not really an agenda that begins to touch on what's happening in society. It is an agenda that is driven by that very logic that we have been you know, struggling about for a very, very long time, and I think that's what needs to, to change. And again, your second question uh, on, uh, on uh, is society homogeneous, are the aspirations distinct and all that? Um, in fact, if I was to do it, I would flip the question the other way around. The problem is not so much whether society is homogeneous, whether, I mean, society is, is, is very varied. But I think what is problematic is that the security agenda tends to be homogenizing. Again, that's the problem. Uh, that uh, we have a society that is being influenced by a whole range of forces that is saying very many things, but we only are hanging on to specific narrow definitions of what security is, how it should be delivered, and all that. And so you begin to see that that representation of security focuses on only a particular sector, and the rest is hanging on the other side, and that be becomes a problem. So again, I think that's I would flip the, the, the question the other way and say, what is it that is contained in that security agenda? And how is it appreciating the diversity of voices in society to the extent that we can actually begin to appreciate not the homogeneity, but actually the diversity of our own societies and what they are saying about this security question? Uh, thank you for the questions, because I think these questions particularly would make uh, my presentation better understood. Uh, the first question, uh, Albert was interested in, uh, in, in me clarifying uh, the situation where uh, you remove uh, an important actor, where he considers an important actor uh, here, Chad, uh, from in, 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 an important security operation, as is the case in the Central African Republic now. Now, to answer that question, uh, we need to uh, to uh, realize that uh, if Chad has been has withdrawn from the MISCA force uh, recently, uh, it has been a major contributor of troops to the peacekeeping effort in the Central African Republic. Now, when I uh, uh, spent some time in the Central African Republic in 2011, I saw the crisis uh, that we witnessed recently coming. I was totally convinced that after the elections, uh, the Central African Republic was going to uh, plunge into the situation that we have seen. Why? Because after talking to uh, taxi drivers, to those people on the streets, it was clear that there was a serious threat to security in the Central African Republic. This threat was uh, one that was not only in the uh, local, uh, but one that was also external. And of the sources, you might want to uh, still think, uh, for those that are very uh, interested in looking at the impact of colonization on Af African uh, countries on security in Africa, you might want to, to look at France. But when you look at external threats to security in the Central African Republic, my findings have been clear 
that these have come more from neighbors than from uh, extra regional, extra continental players. And Chad has been a major source of insecurity in the Central African Republic. In 2003, it is Chad, whether people like it or not, that brought Bozize to power. And a major part of the Bozize uh, uh, close guard, uh, presidential guard, was made up of a Chadian contingent. And this has actually not been taken well by Central Africans for all the time Bozize was in power. Because in the end, these are the people that were looting the state, you know, depriving uh, those uh, those Central Africans in different, uh, in the East, in the North, and the West, uh, of the, the, the very little they had as resources. So the, a good part of Central Africa was interested in Bozize leaving. But the problem is, what was the alternative? So you see, the leadership issue comes into play. But, but at the heart of it, leadership when it gets in has to be that leadership that will be able to identify what really is the source of the problem and address it so when uh, a new peacekeeping force was sent uh, to address the crisis that came with the selecta rebellion and i saw uh, in that um, in 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 that comp uh, in, in that force a, a very important Chadian contingent, I was appalled. And I tried to intervene because at the time uh, it was the French that were very involved. So I had some correspondence with uh, the director of cabinet of Francois Hollande, but well, they didn't listen. And my point was the Chadians are not supposed to be part of this force because you don't expect people to think you're bringing security to them if for so long you have been doing just the contrary. So when we are looking at regional efforts, we are not looking at what an individual state does. But we're saying that when you have a regional framework, that regional framework should function in a way as to actually to take the, the, the decisions that would enable it to address what the real issues are. And so when you include in the peacekeeping force that sort of contingent, it doesn't solve the problem. Now, one way of going around that is actually to, uh, to develop a kind of autonomous uh, body within the region that is going to regulate uh, that, that is going to address uh, these problems of insecurity, meaning that when you have troops from Chad, these troops are, should be seen as being detached, completely detached from their government. So they are receiving orders from a body that has significant autonomy in actually taking decisions and implementing them, meaning you, you, while you're on the ground, Idris Debi, uh, is not the one giving you orders, telling you what to do. Uh, it is uh, your force commander, it is your, your, your chief of mission uh, that is taking those decisions based on uh, the, uh, the, the situation on the ground. And uh, of course, if you have to seek uh, authorization for anything, it should be probably uh, the general, uh, uh, sec from the general sec secretariat of, of ACAS. But when you have an intergovernmental kind of framework where these troops come from states and remain under the control of those states, it is important for you to avoid uh, accepting that there should be contributions from states that may have or that clearly have some uh, have interests uh, that go contrary to the interest of preserving the peace in the particular country uh, where you want to restore it. Uh, that question, of course, uh, is reinforced by the second one, which uh, was, uh, do you, which, which, which actually wants uh, uh, us to look at uh, the, this, the question of whether we are saying the state should not exist in security operations. Are we 
saying the state uh, should be put aside. Uh, if I understood uh, Dr. Ika's uh, question well, that's uh, what, 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 what it is. Now, but uh, the issue when we talk about uh, uh, reconceptualizing security, uh, rethinking security, original security, is not that we want states to disappear. States have their role. When you put in place a regional mechanism, it is the states, at least in today's context, uh, that put these mechanisms in place. But we are saying that these mechanisms should actually function in a way uh, that the source of decision is the base, the look, the, the, the different, the, the, the populations that they are actually put in place to serve. So the status uh, conception of security actually to me is one that looks at, at the state and the state here from a very reductionist conception being the government, being the institutions of the state as one as the end of security. But when we want to rethink it, we are based on the situations that we, we actually uh, look at, uh, then we, 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 we begin to say, well, uh, for so long, uh, security has been about keeping uh, President Bozize in power. Bozize in power means uh, stability in the Central African Republic, but that's not it. Uh, the, the end is the Central Africans. So if at the regional level, uh, you, you're, you're thinking about security as being the Central Africans, then they would have been consulted in one way or the other, and definitely uh, the, the ECAS force, uh, the, 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 the French force that was being sent to the Central African Republic, or, 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 or generally the international effort uh, in security, would have understood if Central Africans were involved in decision making. It's not a very complex thing because it just by, 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 by organizing forums like this in one or two uh, places in, in a country, you would know what exactly the population wants, sorry. Now, so once you involve the population, the people that are the primary beneficiaries of security in uh, security uh, decisions, then you are more likely to have the right results I want to end by saying that when this is not done, the consequence is usually the total collapse of the state because the state that exists for a population can no longer exist if that population is itself annihilated. So that's why security has to be about the interest of the population and not the interest of uh, a select few. Uh, some may call that elite, but you are not safe as an elite if in your, in, if in your country uh, people would be recruited easily with uh, 1,000 CFA uh, to join a rebellion. You are not safe because once that comes out, you have an army that's bigger than the state army. And that's been the case in the Central African Republic. So I, I hope we address those things. Thank you. Gentlemen, we need to take my cue from you. As far as I know, we're about five minutes from the two hours. What do you say? Is that too quick? Because Bubakar also still has to respond to questions only, and then I'm going to have to ask the um, presenters to be very brief in their report back. Otherwise, our other two panels um, are going to be hugely constrained. So we've got a question there and a question here. Okay, I'll make an exception here as well, but please, colleagues, keep it brief and the responses as well. Rebecca, will you then, in the end, do a response to everything, please? Hello, um, my name is Kiale Nyayana. I'm on the uh, African Leadership Fellowship, Security Leadership and Society at King's College. And my question goes specifically to Murunga 
Um, one of the dominant uh, arguments that has come from discussion since yesterday is this notion of uh, Weberian conception of the state. And like we know, what Max Weber was actually trying to say is that you can define a state from its ability to take control of weapons of, I mean, the tools of coercion. And what the discussion we had since yesterday and even today trying to say is that societies in Africa has had control of weapons and have been able to provide security for its local population. And that in the post-Cold War era, what we have seen is a resurgence of you know, vigilantism that has not been you know, providing security to the local people. I agree with all that, but my point is that if you take some certain context into consideration, for instance, the Niger Delta, you see it's local question. communities. You see local communities mm -hmm. in the Niger Delta also acquiring weapons that they are not able to take control of. And those weapons have become even incentives for communal conflicts to the extent that some you know, okay, people... To get to the question. I'm sorry, but I have to yes, stop pushing now. I'm just trying now. to make a contribution. But, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's not a question. Yes, it's just a contribution. Maybe I will finally ask a question. Okay. So, no, 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 no. No, no. Keep it, okay. please, be reasonable. Okay, so my point really is that I agree that in the post-Cold War era, communities are resorting to vigilantism mm. as a source of protection because of the failure of the states. But the predominant view since yesterday and even today is that local communities have actually been doing this. But I'm taking a point of view from the Niger Delta, whereby local communities themselves are busy acquiring weapons in which they are not also able to control. And that has become a source of and proliferation and also incentive for communal conflict. So to that extent, my question would have been that, what will Morunga respond to that? Because the assumption is that... Okay, okay. he's got it. <laughs> You've got it. You know what you've got to respond to. Okay. My name is Adewale Ajabi. Um, it's not a question, it's a contribution. And my contribution is from the perspective of complex system and looking at it as a multidisciplinary engagement. I think that there is an assumption that we're operating on. And from Lyle talked about engineering, that change is expert-led, a very dangerous one. Because you cannot direct a living system. You can only disturb it. And when we're talking about living systems, we're talking about things like security, when people group together. And also, there's a fundamental assumption that we can have infinite instability. But there is no infinity in instability. There's always bounded instability. There's always limit. Because in every group of people, there's embedded order. So the question or the challenge is not to fear or to fear equilibrium. When we're talking about security, we should be fearful of the idea that the solution is achieving equilibrium. But the challenge is to be adaptive and develop adaptive systems in leadership, in engagement, in discipline of engaging in a cross-functional approach and in being consciously incompetent in engaging our people. Thank you. And I... One more and then we're done. Maybe I'll defer. I think I'll bring it on the next question. Okay, then I'll... Come on here. Yeah, you're leaving. Okay, so you can go. I'm sorry. Oh, Maybe right. another uh, round. Yeah. I know he's leaving. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you are kind. I, I, I've enjoyed this uh, session in terms of the effort to reconceptualize, and I think there's there's a lot of meat in the presentations which uh, you have given to us. Um, as as for me, you said it's it's so complex and the, the complexities in terms of their layers and dimensions as such that um, as you responded to Eka, I thought one thing which might be useful um, to stretch your effort further might be also to begin to think of um, typologies of societal conversations mm -hmm. 
and typologies of states that arise from such conversations that can help us to have, um, for want of a better word, a disciplined engagement with the endeavor which you, you, you are proposing to us um, in a way that will provide uh, a security architecture that is more adapted, um, not necessarily static, but adapted to the needs and demands uh, of the times. Um, and in this connection also, I think I mean, one of the strong points running through your presentations is, uh, is a certain sense of dialectic. But I did not see enough of that dialectic reflected in the state society dynamic. Um, the state as a conceptual category does not make sense independent of society. Uh, and so to that extent, one has to see, and it's not to say that the relationship, as you rightly pointed out, will always be benign. Um, a state can be completely disconnected. I mean, colleagues have always talked about organicity of states as being the desirable uh, kind of outcome that we would lo love to see. But um, the state can actually, in this sense, become a rogue institution, disconnected from society, uh, and even beginning to acquire a certain logic of its own uh, in which the security of the state itself becomes an end uh, as well as uh, a means to the achievement of other ends. So um, if we keep that dialectical interconnection in mind and pro probably try to see how to typologize some of the conversations, um, I, I think it will allow for much greater clarity. Thank you very much uh, for this conference and uh, I beg to take my leave and wish you all the very best to the rest of the deliberation. Thank you. Let's have our responses in the reverse order. So we'll start with you, Bubakar, then we're going to Kiban, um, Godwin, Fumi, and then we're done. I, I promise I'll be very, very brief, uh, particularly that uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the responses to the, the various questions are quite good. Safe travels. And see you in 10 years. <laughs> I haven't seen him since 2001. Uh, all right. I, I was uh, uh, going to say that uh, I, I will not be uh, long. Uh, I, I think the, the answer I prepared for uh, Eka's uh, excellent question uh, uh, was really taken uh, uh, on by uh, Fumi and Goodwin uh, uh, very, very nicely. She asked a pretty good question. Uh, as far as what the role of the state in regional integration. And that role also is, is quite the same in terms of reconceptualizing security, not just security, but development and, and all the other good things within uh, the confines of the nation state. I will just add one uh, nugget of information uh, for the benefit of, of Kevin, and also maybe to, to add that layer that we haven't heard too much of, that is, the, the role of the international community or international actors uh, in the security dynamics uh, in our states and uh, in our region. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, the, the uh, South African region has been lagging far behind all the others as far as uh, arriving at a formula of security uh, that uh, can help uh, prevent or at least resolve uh, the, uh, the question uh, raised by the breakdown of, uh, of the CAR. Now, uh, sure, uh, uh, Chad played the role that you, you described. But do not forget that in 2003, uh, when uh, Bojide fled, uh, do you know where he landed? Uh, well, I'll give it to you, he landed in Paris. Do you know where further he landed? at the door of Arriva, uh, looking for a job. And uh, he got more than a job. And that's how he was able to go back through Jamena and go and take over uh, Bangui in, uh, November, in uh, March 2003. So that tells you the role of an actor as France is in the complex situation that developed in uh, the CAR, but also regionally. Uh, many of the states, if not all of them, happen to be former French colonies. And French has had a lack 
uh, uh, on the security dynamics in that region. And that's why maybe it is lacking so far behind. That's done it discreetly uh, through actors uh, in the region. But do not discount the role that France and other actors play in our security predicament. This is true in the uh, uh, Horn of Africa. It is becoming even more apparent, even more, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, a patent in the Sahel region. So please, whatever we do in analyzing our uh, problems, uh, yes, they start with, uh, within our states, within uh, the failure of our elites, uh, within the disconnect between the state uh, and society, but also the role of external actors is very, very important to bring in the mix uh, for the analysis. And again, uh, excellent uh, contributions uh, and excellent questions. Well, I think uh, I, I wouldn't be really answering to. I think I wouldn't really be answering to any question because from the second round, uh, no question uh, to my understanding was addressed to me. Uh, but I want to uh, say that uh, I definitely did not neglect uh, the role of uh, extracontinental, as I put them, actors. But that uh, what I, I saw was that uh, the, 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 the continental actors, uh, when you're looking at uh, external players, those that are from the continent, uh, whether you're looking at Libya, uh, the DRC with... Uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba, uh, who appear to play a predominant role as far as instability in the Central African Republic is concerned. Uh, before 1990, uh, all the coups and so on, uh, France definitely uh, was, uh, uh, took front stage in the Central African Republic. Uh, but from uh, the end of the Patasse regime, uh, there has been uh, some sort of disengagement from that particular country. So it is not completely absent, but the major source as far as external actors are concerned, I see that with neighbors in, uh, in the region. Thank you. Kiade, I actually didn't think you wanted to ask a question. I think you wanted to illustrate the case. Uh, because we, we, we need to remember that uh, I think the mistake we tend to make is to assume that Max Weber was making a definitive statement about how states must be going forward. And I don't think that's what he set out to do. Constructed his argument as an ideal type. And uh, I, I think that leaves enough room for us to fit in the Niger Delta case and any other case that we want to talk about. So I thought you were providing a useful uh, illustration of the nuances we need to pay attention to when we are thinking about how this fits. No, no, I, yes, I, I really think I don't have much to add. I totally take the point made uh, by Bio that actually we'll probably need to interrogate this, you know, uh, in a deeper sense, uh, develop typologies of conversations and typologies of states. And perhaps actually part of some of the conversations might end us uh, lead to a reassessment of the kind of state, you know, mm -hmm. of the state that, that, you know, emerges from that process. Maybe that's part of, you know, what it's about, but point well taken. Thank you. <coughs> Colleagues, I think some very useful feedback that the authors got there and that can really assist them in the deepening and strengthening of their papers for the eventual publication. So I want to thank not only the presenters, we're very dependent on the feedback that we get from the um, audience. Thank you very much for that. We will break now for and come back after one hour for our next session. So if I'm right, it will be what? Quarter past two? Is that, are we agreed? So at quarter past two, we will start with our next session. 
enjoy your lunch and thank you very much to everyone for this session.